All right, I would like to welcome everyone to uh, tonight's regularly scheduled board meeting for May 28, 2003. And I'd like to call the meeting to order. Dr. Cash, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please stand. Ready? We also have headsets for the hearing impaired, if anybody would needs one of those. And we will begin today's meeting um, with uh, uh, updates, recognitions from the superintendent. Thank you very much, President Lamon. Um, I'd like to have the following students please step up to the podium. John Grosson, Andrew Dutcher, Alex Myberg, Delilah Bullock, and Charlie Green. All right, well, we've got three here. I'd like our community to meet these three students because at the last board meeting, I told the board about an outstanding group of Dos Pueblos High School students who won a prestigious Carnegie Mellon nationwide competition for high school students called the Toaster Wars. The purpose of the Toaster Wars is to encourage computer security and computer science education. Their advisor, Kevin McKee, and I haven't seen Mr. McKee, so I don't know if he made it this evening, um, helped facilitate the, um, the Art Dos Pueblos' um, role in the competition. With funding from the National Security Agency, Symantec, Intel, Microsoft, and prizes from Amazon, Carnegie Mellon professor, professor David Brumley and his team created a very, very difficult exercise in critical thinking skills and endurance. Because of the rigor, Dr. Brumley and his staff did not expect all problems to be solved by any of the participants. Here's the game's challenge. When a robot from space crash lands in your backyard, it's up to your hacking skills to fix him and uncover the secret he carries. According to the Department of Homeland Security's National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies, Toaster Wars participants must reverse engineer, break, hack, decrypt, or literally do whatever it takes to solve the challenge. This is the challenge for what we would say are our guys wearing the white hats in cybersecurity. 10,000 students competed, but it was team 1064 that's with us here tonight because they took first place in the nation. And, Coming in first is certainly spectacular, but this group of students was the only team mm. to defy the odds and solve all of the toaster war problems, which is also just incredible. <laughs> the students win means $8,000 for the school, which I'm sure will be spent in the computer science education program plus $4,000 for the team, plus Amazon Web Service, as well as some technical books. It's incredible not only to have the national championship team with us, but also an extraordinarily creative group of young men. And I understand there was a young woman on the team as well, um, representing not only Dos Pueblos High School, but our community here in Santa Barbara and our school district, Santa Barbara Unified. So thank you very much, gentlemen, and congratulations on your fantastic <laughs> award. Ms. 
Parker has something to say. I, I just have to ask about your name, your team name. What made you choose that? Um, point of clarification, it was not team 1064, but 1064 degrees centigrade bread. Um, 1064 degrees centigrade is, among other things, the melting temperature of gold, but that temperature in kelvins is 1337 kelvins, which is a bit of an inside joke for computer hackers. <laughs> I thought there must be more to that, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, and congratulations. Will you do me a favor, and please, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we bring forward, or I at least go recognize the other two missing teammates, but please share with them when you see them at school, if you do see them this week. Congratulations and a thanks for being uh, wonderful students and representing our district and our community and yourselves and your family. So thanks for coming tonight. Did any of you bring your parents with you? Would they please stand so we could recognize them as well for supporting these great students. Thanks for coming, guys. Appreciate it very much. Great job. And if you'd like to see yourself on television. You will be on television on public access on Saturday at 5 o'clock. And I believe Cox has changed it to channel 100 and... 141, something like that. But I'm sure you'll figure it right out and just. <laughs> At a recent education celebration in Buellton, several of our staff members were recognized for the incredible job that they do each day. This year's Venico Crystal Apple Educator Awards honored many of our staff. Um, and I'd like to ask them to come forward and be recognized by our school board as well. And I'll ask Mr. Handel to please uh, hand them, if you could come forward and stand next to the podium. Uh, Susanna uh, Valenzuela, Classified Employee, La Cuesta High School, the Outstanding Classified Employee of the Year. Oh, well, we need you to stay up here because I know Barbara's going to want pictures. Robin Seltzer, Outstanding Secondary Teacher from Dos Pueblos High School. I don't think Robin's here tonight, but congratulations to Robin. Sergio Castaneos, Certificated Support Provider, but that's not really enough of a phrase for his work at San Marcos High School. Congratulations. And also from San Marcos High School, Jennifer Foster, Administrator, one of our Assistant Principals at San Marcos. I'd have to say each day all four of the individuals, and three of them are here tonight, demonstrate their commitment to the success of all of our students, and it's an honor to have them in our company and part of our district. A teacher who needs no introduction is Dos Pueblos High School's Amir Abu Shair. And at that same celebration, Amir received this year's Marvin Melvin Career Technical Education Award. Uh, if you don't know, Amir is our director of the Dos Pueblos Engineering Academy. Uh, an incredible teacher and an inspiration to thousands of students, not only at Dos Pueblos, but throughout our nation. And if you haven't already seen the Engineering Academy robotics demonstration, I can guarantee it will amaze you. And you should schedule time to, to, uh, to witness that. Congratulations and thank you, Amir, as well. And last and certainly not least, um, Santa Barbara Unified School District is very proud to announce um, that Kelly Choi is the Santa Barbara County 2014 Teacher of the Year. Congratulations, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly is a Dos Pueblos High School math teacher, and she was selected for her dedication, leadership, enthusiasm, creativity, and remarkable contributions, not only inside, but also outside the classroom. She's been a teacher for 17 years, and the past 15 of those have been at Dos Pueblos High School. She's led the efforts to integrate technology in the classroom, develop ways to effectively use it in the classroom, and she's also one of our technology coaches. She's also the director of the Dos Pueblos Academy, which provides intensive attention to students who are at most at risk of not graduating from high school. Kelly is truly a teacher's teacher, and we're fortunate to have her on our staff and part of our district. Congratulations. And I'd like to say, this, this, these five individuals here um, represent um, uh, the best and brightest in our district, but I think they would all, all of them would say they also represent dozens, if not hundreds, of other teachers, counselors, administrators, and classified staff 
and great work that those people do each and every day that may not go recognized. But I want to congratulate and thank you all um, for the great work you're doing and keep it up. And thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Well, it's an honor tonight to also recognize six individuals who together have provided a total of 190 years of service to our school district and the children in our community. We have 30 year pins to give to people and the first is Dan Garski, an administrator from San Marcos High School. Thank you, Dan. Next is teacher Charlene Doty from our child development program. Thank you, Charlene. And third is Francine Steele, a teacher from Harding University Partnership School. And our fourth 30-year pin goes to Pamela Steele, also from Harding University Partnership School. Washington. Washington, excuse me. I misread that. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. We have two employees that we're going to recognize for 35-year pins. And I think one of them was a teacher of one of our board members. <laughs> From Harding University Partnership School, that's Karen Delfonso, 35 years of service in our district. And our last 35 year pin goes to someone who's probably supervising the, the softball game right now at Dos Pueblos, and that's Jorge Fulco an assistant principal at Dos Pueblos High School. Thank you and congratulations to Jorge as well. <laughs> Two last announcements. Um, don't forget Guys and Dolls at Lacumber Junior High School. It begins on May 31st. It's our final performance of our theater season. It's been an incredible uh, season of musicals and comedies this spring with great things happening at all of our secondary schools. And finally, I would like to thank Lane Wheeler, and I'd like to ask him to come forward. I'd like to la thank Lane for his leadership in the Santa Barbara Teachers Association, a role he has filled for the past six years. And as a small token of our thanks, I'm going to present you with this plaque. It says, in recognition make sure I don't miss, of, the of your dedication to the Santa Barbara Unified School District 2007 to 2013. Thank you, Lane, very much. <laughs> and with that, I conclude the superintendent's report. Wow, well, that was a great superintendent's report. And thank you for everyone um, for your service, for your years of service. As was said, Mrs. Dolfonso was my second grade teacher, so it's so exciting to be here to recognize her 35 years of service, as well as everybody else um, who I know and some folks I know from the community. So thank you all. Board, this is our opportunity to uh, announce any comments or correspondence. Anything that anybody would like to share? All right, hearing none, um, I, oh. oh. I'll, just, I'll make a couple. I was able to attend the um, ICANN art uh, display at uh, Franklin School. So that was the final um, ICANN pr uh, program for this year, but every school that ICANN's involved in is absolutely tremendous. And again, there's samples up there of second grade work uh, at one of the schools. Another really fascinating uh, event was the Santa Barbara Dance Institute. Uh, although not technically a Santa Barbara district program, but so, several of our schools are involved in it. And this year there were 300 students from uh, schools throughout the, throughout the area. And just an hour of dance by young men and young, young boys and young girls. And to see the activity at that level and what they go through to put on that show was fascinating. And then there was an IEP, parents, uh, a parent's guide to an IEP, IEP process that was put on at the Globe Theater 
by our, ed our special education department. Again, it was, the room was packed with people uh, asking questions about the IEP process. So I want to thank Helen for putting that on and her team for putting that on. It was well received. Thank you, Mr. Heron. All right, so with that, we move to announcements of closed se uh, session action. In case number 2013-14-2, the board denied the appeal. The motion was made by Mr. Heron and seconded by Kate Parker with a 5-0 vote. In, uh, uh, Mr. Heron also made a motion to approve the Casey waiver for student 0247, and that motion was seconded by Ms. Parker, and that was a 5-0 vote. And, the uh, board moved to approve a settlement in case number 20134071212 and case number CV1300136 MWF SHX in the amount of $62,500. The motion was made by Mr. Heron and seconded by Parker with a 5 0 vote. Next, we're moving on to public comment. We do have one public comment at this time. Uh, Mr. Paul Rooney from the CSEA. Uh, good evening. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Paul Rooney, president of the local chapter of the California School Employees Association. Uh, good evening once again to board members Ms. Lamone, Ms. Parker, Mr. Heron, Ms. Idelson, and Mr. Paz, uh, Dr. Cash. I'm here to ask the question, why? <clears throat> year after year, the staff in this school district has been told health increases are on you, you, the employee, and not us, the employer. Why is it that for the past five years or so, classified employees have not been included in some kind of budget building because of cost increases? Why have we been left to barely squeak by and go with less than basic necessities year after year? And yet, we are asked to do more. Why hasn't the board taken any responsibility or given support for building uh, the increases of, in he of health benefits into the budget, like many other school boards do? Why do classify employees continue to give more and take home less? As classified employees, we are faced with the continuing dilemma of escalating medical costs. It is particularly discouraging to hear year after year how the board has thrown up their hands and said there is nothing they can do. These are the feelings of my fellow classified employees. Why don't you all put your heads together, stop taking the easy way out, and compassionately find a way to take care of the people that from day to day watch your back and make sure that all is comfortable for the children of this district. There are districts all over the state and this county that share in the increased costs of health insurance. Why don't you? It takes a community. Thank you for your time. And that concludes public comment. We are moving to the consent agenda. Board, are there any items in the consent agenda that you would like to pull? Mr. Heron? I'd like to pull um, E4, which talks about the health and welfare benefits, and E6, uh, the um, approval of the uh, MA billing process. All right, I've made a note of E4 and 6. Board, any other consent agenda, agenda items you'd like to pull? I, I would like to make a request that we talk about E4 uh, immediately rather than waiting until the end of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Heron. We'll do. All right, so hearing no other consent agendas um, would like to be pulled, uh, I'll go ahead and take a motion. I'll move to approve the remainder of the consent agenda. Thank you, Ms. Parker. 
I'll second it. Thank you, Ms. Idelson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. And we will go ahead and take um, agenda. Consent agenda item E4 now, and that's approval of the 2013-14 health and welfare benefit plans as recommended by the district's insurance committee. And I believe, Dr. Cash, we will have. Mr. I've asked Mr. Tangway to explain the process. Thank you. Good evening, board members. Um, for the last 10 years or so. Um, the district has had an insurance committee that is made up of SBTA representatives, CSEA representatives, and also uh, representatives from the district. Uh, this year, we met three times, February the 1st, April 29th, and May 16th, uh, and the purpose of those meetings was to look at the renewal that we got from our carrier, the CISC, uh, self-insured schools of California pool and then to make recommendations uh, to the board about what plans we would uh, seek to have you approve for 1314. Um, this year we did get a shock, quite a shock, when we discovered that our HMO plan which covers most of our employees was slated to rise by 30 percent. About 736 employees are enrolled in our two HMO plans and we have about 254 employees in our three PPO plans. Um, the question of, of course is why is this and there are a number of reasons for it. Um, for one thing, HMO plans are beginning to rise in cost nationwide and they're now in some cases just as expensive if not more expensive than PPO plans. Uh, we also have the conundrum in the local area of the cottage Sansom monopoly and in a market where there is no competition, you see r increases such as we are seeing now. And in the CISC pool, um, very few of the member districts offer HMO plans. Most offer PPO plans to their employees. And for that reason, when CISC is allocating dollars internally, they allocated them to keep the cost of the PPO plans down. Um, and they didn't allocate much, if anything, to the HMO side. And the Santa Barbara Unified School District is the largest contingent in the CISC local HMO pool. Um, we've been with CISC about three years. We were hoping that the stability of being with one carrier over time would alleviate the fact that we used to go out to bid yearly or every other year. Uh, we'd get typically a very good renewal rate from an insurance carrier and then in the subsequent years we would get socked with a very, very large renewal once they, all of our experience was factored in. So that is where we are today. Thank you. We do have Ms. public comment on this. Uh, Lane Wheeler. Thank you, Lane Wheeler, Santa Barbara uh, Teachers Association President. I had to remember what I do. Um, I, I would like to concur with uh, Brian's comments. They are accurate. Uh, it doesn't change the outcome nor the responsibility that we all have to try to make the system better. Uh, hopefully the Affordable Care Act will create resolution that we don't see right now, but Brian and I highlighted it. We have a one-horse uh, one town for hospitals and we tend to have higher cost. I think there's a challenge that's put before us with this renewal and that's to do what we can to create some sort of healthy employee plan or something that's gonna create some control on costs that we, we can't see right now. I've been on the insurance committee for 10 years. We've constantly pushed costs out to users on those um, to try to keep the overall premiums down and we've been successful. We've been successful in beating the national average which is something on the order of 15%. But when you look at our last six years, we've had about a 50% increase in the cost of insurance. We have employees now that are healthy individuals that if they get hit crossing the sidewalk, God forbid, 
it's going to cost him $12,500 to go to the hospital. Now, that may be small in comparison to the total overall cost, but these are folks who are working on very thin budgets in terms of being able to survive in Santa Barbara. I'm speaking for the certificated unit, which has a little more uh, ability to afford that than the classified, but our classified brothers and sisters are even in worse conditions than they are. This is not anybody's fault, this is not anybody's problem, but it's all of our responsibility to try to do what we can. Uh, I don't know if that's to reach out to other groups that are in the CISC pool locally to see if we can do some sort of uh, networking to try to bring a combined pressure upon the, uh, the providers, but we've got to do something to try to alleviate the cost increases. It's just uh, n you know, un unacceptable to have a 30% increase in a plan with 700 members being served. And that expands out to something on the order of 2,000, 3,000 people when you look at dependents. So it's really untenable. Uh, you know, we looked at these plans when they were presented to us, and you felt like you were being given the choice of being shot or being hung. You know, which plan do you really want? And we didn't really come out with a strong recommendation for any of those. We realized what we have is probably the best we're able to do. And you're going to make that decision to support that, I am sure. But it is a challenge that we all face and we all have to be responsible for. Thank seconds. you. Thank you for the feedback and comments. So we do have to take action on this board. I'll make the motion to approve uh, item E4. Uh, the reason I asked to pull it was just to put out in the public the, the situation and hear an explanation of how we got to this point. I thought I felt better at least hearing a discussion on it than just voting consent calendar. So I'll make the motion to approve it. Thank you, Mr. Heron. I'll second it. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. We are moving on to the action agenda item. And that's approval of fundraising activity for phase one of the Dos Pebbles High School Stadium Master Plan and reservation of me Measure Q bond funds for matching contribution. Going to bring forward David Hetyunk and Sean Carey, principal of Dos Pueblos High School. Thank you, Dr. Cash, members of the board. Uh, at the last board meeting, we brought to you information on the Dos Pueblos uh, High School Athletic Master Plan, a five-phase plan. Currently, we're asking that the district approve the fundraising activity for phase one of the program, and Sean and her staff is here tonight and other associates uh, to present you with their fundraising plan and, and, and how they intend to raise their $625,000. They're also asking for a reservation of Measure Q funds of $625,000. They're not asking you to approve the spending of funds. They're asking you to reserve the funds so they can be used for matching funds should they be successful in raising funds. I have no doubt in my mind with the uh, fundraising activities that have taken place in the past in this district that the figure of $625,000 is, is not unreasonable for them to attain. I've been in here for 13 years now and I've seen some amazing fundraising, uh, millions of dollars by various groups, uh, and, and it's just amazing what this community uh, gives it back to education. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sean for her presentation on their uh, fundraising uh, proposal. Thank you, Mr. Hetyonk, and good evening, board, Dr. Cash. Um, I want to first just take a moment as a site-level administrator to thank you for taking the time to honor uh, several outstanding educators in our district. I can affirm, again, as a principal, that they do, in fact, represent dozens and hundreds more of, of excellent educators um, serving uh, our, our students uh, pre-K-12 in our school district. Um, we are here before you again. Uh, Two weeks later, to detail further for you our request, or rather the request that we're representing on behalf of Charger Associates uh, for the matching measure Q funds uh, for phase one of our stadium improvement project. Again, this is the phase that uh, 
that targets the upgrades to the track and field, uh, similar to the project that was completed at San Marcos. Um, I'm going to introduce a, a few folks that I've brought with me. We did speak last time about the uh, the improvements that this would represent, not just for athletics uh, use, but also for our community use and uh, our school-wide use, programs outside athletics that would benefit. So Athletic Director Dan Feldhaus will be joining me. He's coming straight from the softball game, so he feels a little self-conscious about his attire, but I assured him that would be understood. Um, we did just lose that semifinal uh -huh. playoff. Uh, game in the 11th inning, so it was a really good game. But I also will introduce Dan Choi. He's our PE department chair, and he's the former athletic director. So I'm going to have Dan come up. Um, he can speak to any questions you might have about athletics, but also uh, he's in a special position to, to speak to any questions you might have about school use that is broader than just athletics. And it does include PE and PE classes, um, but also I would have you keep in mind um, band and cheer and other groups that use the field, even for events like graduation and other school-wide events. Um, I also will bring up Larry Vranish. You know Larry already from our, our presentation two weeks ago. If Larry, you could come on up. Larry has served as, he's a retired Dos Pueblos teacher and he has served for many years as an administrative designee um, in the area facilities. And he is particularly knowledgeable about this project because he's been involved uh, from the outset with the Turf Committee, which was the original fundraising group. Um, it represented interested parents as well as committed community partners. Uh, Larry was involved with that committee. Um, he's also familiar with the site, the facilities on site, the personnel on site. He's familiar with district regulations and district personnel and he's literally familiar with everybody from board members and superintendents down to the, uh, the gardeners who are doing the work on the field each and every day. So he understands all aspects of what we're proposing in this project. Um, we outlined for you two weeks ago our belief that the, that the improvement of the stadium and track is commensurate with the outstanding accomplishments of Dos Pueblos, both academically and co-curricularly. We also highlighted for you um, our confidence that this will be an environmentally superior facilities upgrade in terms of our sustainability and our stewardship of, of our precious resources, particularly water. Um, what we wanted to be able to provide you with tonight is a better understanding and, and to answer any questions you might have about our fundraising plans and our confidence in the ability to, to match uh, or to generate the $625,000 that uh, are, are necessary on the site's end, on the on part of Charger Associates uh, for completion of, of phase one. Um, I, I wanted to remind you that our our fundraising organization has already raised a third of this amount through largely grassroots efforts, and by that I mean things like penny drives and t-shirt sales and concessions at games and those kinds of activities. So we've not yet even launched. Um, we did have some significant donations come from community partners and businesses and individuals connected to the Dos Pueblos community, but we've not even launched a formal fundraising campaign yet, and we're already over $200,000 raised. So I wanted to... Um, highlight that. I wanted to reassure you because I think there might have been some confusion a couple of weeks ago that the Charter Associates has already assumed the cost for the architectural uh, drawings and, and the fees associated with the conceptualization of all phases of the project and is prepared to continue to assume such fees. Um, I know that there were some questions and we can assure you tonight too that we uh, absolutely plan to proceed in accordance with any board policies or administrative regulations that govern fundraisings for such projects. Um, we would also invite you as a board to even prescribe timelines or other conditions on the project that would be behoove you um, in, in being good stewards of these uh, taxpayer dollars. We absolutely understand um, and respect the district personnel and processes that need to be in place um, for our endeavor. Uh, we do have very successful experience through Measure V projects, it, coordinating construction projects, doing what we can as a site to prepare our site for successful construction projects. We're anticipating a start of uh, no later than June 2014 for this phase one of the project. And we just firmly believe that your support as a board, um, the message that that will send to our community will not only enable us to raise double, but in fact triple and more of the amount that has already been raised to date over recent years. So that's what we're here tonight to ask about. I also understand that you might have some concerns or questions, and I really appreciate your position in terms of looking out for equity across all high school sites, in fact all school sites in the district or school properties in the district, um, and I feel that we're well equipped to answer um, and address any of those concerns as well. So I'm going to ask anybody who's standing behind me who'd like to add to my comments uh, to do so at this time, and then we're all here to field whatever questions that you uh, might have for us. 
Okay. Um, I basically want to talk to you from a, a PE teacher standpoint, and, and it's a, the facilities at Dos Pueblos High School, um, our, our gardeners do the best job that they can, and we're really grateful for the time and effort that they put in, but we have so much acreage that they have to cover. Um, and so in the morning, the fields are wet. If we have a turf field, that's something that the drainage is a lot better with that. Um, and then th my real concern is just the, the state of a lot of the fields because of the squirrel problems that we have, and they're, and they're cute little things, but they do a lot of damage. And so I don't think any of us want us on fields that it could potentially harm any of our students. And we do our best to maintain those fields, but it does take a lot of time and a lot of effort. No, I, I fully support what Ms. Carey said. I think she's presented the palette clearly. One construction factor that I think would be important for board members in terms of entree of a project this size, uh, were it to start in the spring or in the summer and run a little older, uh, a little longer than the summer, the uh, access to the stadium itself is on, you know, is on the west west side of campus with a road and a ramp that would allow access that would essentially frame, if you will, the rest of the campus on the mountainside. In other words, safety, security, other than uh, planning around events or class use until it was done. Uh, I think we've done a lot of thinking about contingencies and having done the pool and the engineering building and uh, infrastructure and uh, theater, I think that would be something where I, a board member, I would want to feel comfortable with, and, and at least in my terms, I would, uh, uh, given the access point at that. Yes. Good evening. <laughs> Sorry, I just ran off the softball field. Uh, a tough game for us. So, um, again, I would just like to emphasize, I assume what uh, the people behind me said, but uh, I think we have a great opportunity here to uh, make Dos Pueblos a great uh, it's already a great school to make it even a better school and uh, I think we have a group of parents that are poised and ready to continue this fundraising and uh, um, look f look forward to hopefully the, um, the support of the, of the board so thank you very much for and I want to open it for if there's any questions um, and from the athletics point of view so I'm sorry I'm a little frazzled <laughs> so okay. good. Thanks. thank you for being here <clears throat> Um, thank you. Um, board, uh, I know we might have some questions. I do want to actually just make a comment that at our Friday board meeting, um, the board did actually begin to explore the process of what a policy might look like, and we realized it is a difficult conversation. So I want to make sure that Dos Pueblos knows that whenever a project comes to us, it does raise district-wide issues, but it's not necessarily a reflection just of a particular school. So I think any specific project in school sometimes comes and thinks that it's about that school or that particular project, but as board members, we're, we're really uh, responsible for thinking district-wide, and so we've done our due diligence by beginning that conversation and recognizing that it's gonna be a difficult one, so we don't have all the answers yet, but we're working on that. It, board, any questions? Oh, and Mr. Yeah. Hanyang. If I can make a, a comment on, on a historical uh, uh, information that the board may not be aware of, like last time I talked about the press box. Uh, with Measure V, the Measure V bond issue had a project in there to convert the 440 meter track to a 400 meter track uh, at San Marcos High School. And that was mainly a majority paid for with bond funds. Following that, uh, a few years down the road, Dos Pueblos High School fundraised to resurface their track with the same type of service and paid for that 100% out of their fundraising. Thank you. So, and I, don't, I think there's some people here that may not be aware of that. Thank you for that. Ms. Eidelson? Um, um, M President Lamone and I made a site visit, and um, it's really interesting because I sh totally understand your concern with the um, holes and you know the drainage there. The drainage that seemed very swampy at the time we were there, you know, just in general, and the grass was really long. And um, I have some questions about the timing. So, if this were to begin, say in June, how, what amount of time is it to bring in the resurfacing of the field and correct all the drainage issues? It's a project that could typically be done over a summertime. Uh, depending on the final drawings and the final scope. If it went a little bit longer than summer, we would meet with the school and the staff and get input from them. Maybe we can get the site two weeks early. Maybe we can uh, uh, 
go one week into the season based on the location of home games. So we look at all those variables and, and then just ask the contractor to bid to the schedule. So if the schedule is eight weeks or nine weeks, the contractor will base his bid on putting sufficient person power on that job uh, to get it done in the allocated time. Because if they don't, then there's liquidated damages that they owe the district. And secondly, on the track that was spoken about um, that was fundraised, I take it that's the current track? That's, that's the there. current track. And how long ago was that done? Six, six years, Larry? Six years. Is yeah. that a typical life of that um, material? Six to ten. It, it, they, they say five to ten. We, we, we've been resurfacing on the upper area, upper side of ten years. However, you know, if you do it sooner, you you spend less money with the resurfacing effort because there's there's a, a lesser amount of preparation and a greater greater of the surfaces to adhere to with less repair and doing that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a lot of times that can that can again extend the life of the next overlay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments, Dr. Buss? Just a quick question. So besides the uh, the team sports, um, on a typical day, how many PE classes would be using the field? Just uh, on a typical day, there's usually somebody out at on the main field every period. Okay. Just about it's a one, yeah, first through sixth period, and then usually after school with the athletics in the afternoon. Okay. Could I add an additional additional comment? This is where the surface itself comes into play, as the year moves on weather, climate, however you go, um, that use is uh, guided use where there may require no structuring for use when the surface is uh, copacetic with uh, December, January, February weather. So there, there, aside from man hours of maintenance, safety certainly, uh, we get a balance in terms of planning and I would guess, having seen other facilities on all the campuses expanded, um, I would expect expect that the current use would be expanded within the school day itself just because of uh, the quality of access. Mr. Heron. <coughs> a couple questions and a comment. Uh, where did the 1250 come from? That was a cost estimate that was created by the uh, Charger Associates in conjunction with uh, Flowers and Associates, the civil engineer who's designing the project. Any bids on that, or just that? No, just no. This, this, this is I mean, just, that's just an estimate. Yeah, this is just an estimate. Okay. And Telecu and didn't, Tele a didn't look at that. A, conserva did they? a conservative estimate. Okay. Telecu didn't look at that as a project. No, they did, did not. They? Yeah, I couldn't find it, so I presume they didn't. Mm -hmm. Is Charger Associates a 501c3? Yes, yes it is. Okay. Um, my comment. Uh, I'm sort of disappointed because last two weeks ago, I made it. I thought I made it clear that I'd like to see a proposal based upon. AR7215, and A127215 A1 starts out with, prior to initiating any fundraising efforts, an individual school group who wishes to augment funds for a bond, et cetera, must present a written proposal to the governing board for approval. I totally expected a written proposal today outlining the seven items that are spelled out in the um, AR. Um, I don't see that at all, and I guess that's what I make my comment, I'm disappointed that I don't see that our own policy is being followed, but yet we're being asked to approve something without knowing um, very much at all about the efforts to date. Um, I can't vote yes um, in violation of the AR. That's that probably my fault. We have a form that we fill out and at the bottom it has the district approval date and the information typically is taken from the board agenda put on that form and then I go around and get signatures. But I can surely, uh, if the board wishes, uh, bring this item back with that form. It's a standard district form and it's, it's probably uh, my fault in doing things backwards. Well, I, I, again, I'll just say at the end of the session two weeks ago, I made it clear I wanted the proposal coming from the applicants as to what, how they're going to uh, abide by the AR, and uh, I, I, I'm just disappointed. Any other questions or comments, board? Ms. Parker? Um, I'm <clears throat> very willing to vote for this, but I agree it should be, we should be seeing a written package. What I see is part of the package. Um, 
uh, and it's just a matter of pulling it all together. So my suggestion would just be that it come to us on consent for the next meeting. Great. And I would actually welcome that as well. I think that this is our opportunity to ask any additional questions, but it can come back to us as a consent item with the written report in order to be in compliance with our board policy if board members feel comfortable with that. Mm. Dr. Buss? I, I would agree. I think I think my comments the last time were, were uh, around sort of the timeline of your of, of your uh, proposal, what you were thinking. I know that it's contingent, like you do one, the phase one would be this, and but at least have a some sense of um, a completion. I'm not clear right now at this point in time in terms of the timelines, and that's, I guess that's the, the same sentiment that our, uh, my fellow board members are echoing at this point. Um, I would be supportive as well, but um, I feel a lot more comfortable when, when something comes to us and I have a sense, at least a better sense of the time. Just want to be clear, we're asking for fundraising approval for phase one only. So did you want information on possibilities of timelines for other phases or did you want us to concentrate on phase one? Phase, phase one was the, 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 the point that was made clear the last time and okay. I think that was what I was talking to uh, okay. at the last board meeting. If I may, you have uh, my personal commitment to work with uh, Mr. Het Young and Ms. Carrie Stead, and we will have the written document to you post haste. And thanks. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And I think the fact that we're asking for it to come back in consent is an expression of our support, but with compliance. If it's going to come back in consent, I would like to see the recommendation to be a maximum of 625000 um, not knowing if the 1250 is good, bad, or indifferent, but we're being asked up to 625000 Any additional comments or questions, board? All right, so we are not going to take an action on this item, and we will uh, hopefully see it back in consent at the next regular board meeting. But thank you all for being here. Thank you for your work with the so uh, softball team. We're sorry about the loss, but we're so thankful you made it very far. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thanks what for your time. What was the score? Three to two and 11 innings. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Tough game. Windy. It was a windy game. <laughs> Right, next on the action agenda item, we have board action on student discipline. In case 2012-13-22, I move to approve the stipulated agreement for a um, full school year expulsion. Second. All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion passes 5-0. Next, we're moving on to our conference agenda. We have discussion of professional learning communities. Dr. Cash. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Handel. Thank you, Dr. Cash. So for most of this year, and, and you, you saw it riddled throughout our, our professional learning plan, um, was the mention of professional learning communities. That's been the big push that we've, we've, we've really focused on this year. And uh, we realized we hadn't brought to you guys the, the information that you, that you needed to really make um, to have a firm understanding of what we're, we're referring to. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background and a little bit of information uh, about professional learning communities and how they function and, and some of the characteristics that you should see from an effective professional learning community. So some of the characteristics that, that you'll see is that they have a shared mission, a, vi a vision, and values. It's, it's really important that they all those on the team, and a team can be anything from a grade level, uh, a team of two, three, four kindergarten teachers, or a content specific um, department, all meeting together um, that have the shared mission, vision, values, that they engage in collective inquiry, um, but they're looking at data, that they work together, they look at each other's results, um, they take action, they, they focus on the curriculum, they look at their instructional strategies, they look at each other's effectiveness. Um, not only are all these, uh, these characteristics um, good for student achievement, but they're also good for teacher efficacy. Um, what you'll find is as, as teachers realize that the changes and modifications they bring or they use uh, in their daily instruction and all their instructional decisions, they become more confident and realize the impact they, they actually do have on, on student learning. The next um, 
slide is the four essential questions. And there are four essential questions that professional learning communities ask themselves. The first one has to do with curriculum. What do we want all students to learn? The second one has to do with assessment and how will we know when each student has acquired the intended knowledge and skills. The third has to do with respond, responding to students who are in need. And that question is how will we respond when students don't acquire the intended knowledge and skills. And finally, the fourth question has to do with those, those students who, are, who, are, who have already grasped the, the concept. And how will we respond when students demonstrate proficiency? Students that are gifted and talented, students that have already mastered these skills and need a little bit more uh, extension or enrichment to help them grasp the concept at a little bit higher level. These questions must be answered in a professional learning community. These are things that they wrestle with every single meeting that they have, whether they're meeting for one hour or meeting for a whole day, they have to be looking at, at data, they have to be looking at student work, they have to look at each other's results, and a, a whole host of other student-centered uh, data to help them drive what they do in the classroom on a daily basis. I can tell you from personal um, experience as a site administrator, what happened at, at McKinley over the course of four years, the teachers began to realize the impact that they had on student achievement, engaging in data analysis, comparing results to each other, talking about the strategies they, they were using. Um, and it really helped change things around. They wanted more data. They tried more things that, that, that typically teachers that, that, uh, that are new or have been in the profession for a while uh, typically don't take these type of risks. But um, they were trying different strategies. They were reading books. They were doing research. They were doing things that, that perhaps they knew they should be doing but didn't realize the impact it could have on student learning. So it was really exciting to see our, our teachers engage in this type of work. There are a lot of, if we can go to the next slide, there are a lot of um, professional learning community um, websites out there. But here are some, some resources that I think um, could really, specifically the top two, all things PLC and solutiontree.com that can give you videos of teachers working as a PLC, can show you what type of work that they do, they can show you some of the products that, uh, that come out of these, these meetings, the impact that it has, not just in a class, not just on a teacher or a student, but school-wide, district-wide, the, the impact of PLCs on our district is something that I'm excited about, I know Dr. Cash is excited about, and I know Dr. Drotti um, are all excited about, um, but we know we have some work to, uh, to accomplish before we get there. So with that I'd, like that, I'd like to open it up to questions. Thank you, Mr. Hando. Board comments or questions? Ms. Parker. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, this is something that the district has been working with its staff on for for a while, and and I feel like there's you know there's been a learning curve, and I and I, I guess I first I would, I'd like to get some feedback on where you feel we are in the professional development process about really understanding the purpose of PLCs when teachers are meeting together, um, and and then having the tools you know if you're if you're trying to think about what do we do if students haven't mastered the material. Um, what tools do teachers have to refer to um, as they come up with their own solutions with their students? That's one question that I have. Um, and are we planning um, district-wide professional development on it this fall? I'm trying to go back to the strategic plan in my head, and I don't remember where that falls in it. Um, and then another question I have is the accountability piece. Is there a, um, obviously administrators can't constantly be in all these different PLC meetings. Um, I know that some sites have had um, minutes essentially, have had, had uh, and I don't know if there's a standard form that the district has or if that's something that's done on a site by site basis. If you could talk a little bit about that too. Well, I'm gonna take the last piece first. Okay. Um, we, we plan to work with the teachers association and our teachers in developing how we, what the accountability structure will look like, and that'll happen over the next year. We, our district has engaged in a, a lot of professional learning community stuff 
Um, and um, as a result of that, we are all over the board in the development of PLCs. And so our goal now is to bring everyone along, get up to the same level so that a professional learning community means the same thing to a teacher, no matter what school they may be at. Um, the same actions take place, the same activities take place, the same level of accountability is part of the process. Um, and that's our goal, and that's, that's, that's won't be accomplished in a short period of time. That'll take uh, quite, a, quite a few years. Um, so. We, you answered the first question, where are we as a district? <laughs> we are all over the place, and depending on what site you're at, you'll see different variations of, of PLCs. As far as the tools are concerned, um, I think what you'll find is that teachers are very resourceful by, by nature. They just, they, they find different resources. Um, as you walk, as I walk through the district, I'd see teachers utilizing different resources, online resources, um, books and what have you, um, doing their own personal research, if that's the type of resources you're referring to. Um, but the resources come in, in, in a whole bunch of different, um, um, and, and a whole bunch of uh, different modes. Um, the training piece is what's most important to us up here. Um, how do we set that up? The first thing we need to do, we realize, is we have to make sure our principals completely understand um, what a PLC is and what to look for. Um, we want, we hopefully, we plan on training our principals and then developing a plan on supporting our teachers to get a bigger understanding and a firm understanding of what PLCs do, how they're run, um, and what they look like. Um, at this point right now, we are still developing that plan, but we can point to examples within our district right now and just filming teachers working together and show that to other teachers who may not have a clue about how PLCs work to show it as an example. So you actually mentioned something that I thought was interesting, training the principals to know what to look out for. So it sounds like the professional learning communities is not just about the teachers and what the teachers contribute to the classroom, but also making sure that the administration at the site is um, on par with what's expected in that particular grade level. Is my hearing that, that correct? That's correct. And we also want to make sure that principals are, are all have the same understanding because we don't want a teacher to go from one site and have an understanding of what PLCs are and then go to another site and it'd be completely different. Great. Thank you. Dr. Bus, I'm curious, and I would uh, love to hear more about um, how you see the role of teachers as this is all rolling out, playing into sort of what best practices may be emerging through sort of developing a standard of PLC communities across school district. Well, what I want to add to um I'm going to answer that question, but first, but I want to respond to it first um, about the, where the principal's position is. I think in order for in order to have an effective collaborative discussion, the environment has to be safe uh, for students to teachers to experiment and actually discuss their weaknesses and their strengths. And that's a tough thing to do in a meeting in front of each other, and possibly in front of an administrator. So, a part of the training that we have to do is to ensure that the environment is safe for people to say fail forward <laughs> in their in their discussion I think uh, as a part of um, learning uh, at the end of when, when, we, when you're looking at students results based on a, a, an agreed upon assignment task um, when it's when a teacher comes up with a better pr uh, product or uh, results the central question then goes to what that teacher did um, uh, we, we don't want teachers to always use the same style. Teachers are free to use their own uh, respective uh, styles. Uh, but if that, if, if that results in a better, uh, better product, then everybody automatically kind of zeroes in on, zeroing on. Then the question becomes, what did you do instead of somebody directing somebody to do something? But the, it becomes more of an inquiry-based uh, learning. So it, it just kind of sets the whole environment to want to learn more and get better and, um, and could continue. So, so it's a cycle that will continue on and on and on. Dr. Bess? Just a comment, more in, more in a question. So as we move forward in, in, um, in the PLC uh, sort of development process, and then we're moving at the same time in terms of uh, instituting EDU, Illuminate, it, I would be curious and would like to know more about how you see those converging as we move forward, because I know that you 
we, we've talked about it even as a board a little bit, but I want to see a little more of, of, of our discussion about that because it, it's, you know, that's the basis of it. The basis is lo looking at data and having a regular access to data and, and, and having the ability of teachers and site administrators to look at data on a more regular basis than perhaps we're doing right now. So I think that's going to be really important to cut for us as a board to, to, to continue to be informed about that. Got it. Absolutely. Ms. Idelson? Um, I see this as sort of a district-wide internal program. How much are you sending teachers out to other districts to observe how other districts are doing things also? Or is that not really part of this? Well, but prior to my arrival, we had people going all over the place for PLC training. Um, lots and lots of trainings occurred outside of the district. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would imagine that some of that will still continue, but our focus right now is to try to, is to, is to work toward creating one sort of way in which we're gonna look at PLCs. And, it, and what I think, I believe that we'll learn from that over time, as, as I, I've shared with the Teachers Association, um, we're not gonna get it right, we're gonna count on f uh, all of us working together to make it right, because really the, you know, the three of us could want it to be a particular way, but it's really gonna be the teachers that are gonna define and determine what parts of it are the most effective ways to get at improving student achievement through that process. So I would anticipate as this rolls out over the next couple of years that we'll spend a lot of time listening to teachers tell us about this really works, this is effective, we need more common assessments so that we can have more data we need the data accessible to, to look at Dr. Paz's questions. How can that be accessible to us during our meeting, you know, so that I can just call up the data on, on my laptop and I, we can all look at an assessment that we just gave all of our second grade students. Um, you know, all of that, I predict, over time will evolve. And the nice thing, as Ms. Idelson recognizes through her question, is that there are many, many districts throughout the nation that have, are way down the line, have already engaged in this process. And we will, as we, I think, kind of bring ourselves together, um, I think we'll have better questions to ask when we go out and learn from other districts as to what they're doing. Because uh, we'll have had more of an, of an experience in the PLC process but we'll definitely plan to do that. All right. Well, thank you. Next, we have the update on Thrive. Dr. Cash? Well, um, I thought it would be a good time to give you an update on Thrive. Um, and so I'm gonna repeat history and talk a little bit about some history and just to, to kind of give us some context. Thrive was established in 2009. It's a collaboration of private and public funders in the Santa Barbara County. First five Santa Barbara County is a major player in Thrive along with school districts, community and public agencies. The goal for Thrive is to have every student college ready. Um, and Thrive is utilizing the collective impact model. And um, I always tell everybody that um, if you've been a high school principal, you know what the collective impact model is because you can't be a, if, you, if you're a successful high school principal, because you can't be one. Because it's defined as organizations from different sectors agreeing to work on student success using a common agenda, aligning their efforts, and using common measures of success. And that's literally um, the collective impact and what I think you have to do it in a, a large school setting. And and the collective impact model, which is what the template is and the theory of action for Thrive, it's not about programs. So you've heard about the programs that we have in Thrive, but it's really not about that. It's about systemic change within the school community in order to get every student college ready. We have five community programs in the Santa Barbara County Thrive Collaborative, but the one that we care most about, we care about them all, but the one we care most about is Westside Thrive. <clears throat> and that's our own Santa Barbara Unified School District Thrive Collaborative. And you'll recall it's um, primarily housed in our four Westside schools, lower Westside schools, I'll say, McKinley, Harding, La Cumbra, and San Marcos High School. Um, so here's a little bit about our work. Our work's been identified in some major areas. The, the first and probably the key area is school readiness. 
and we define that as having high quality care and education available for all of our students, all of the children ages zero to five. Um, and that ha we've spent a lot of effort in preschools and pre-school um, education um, for children in our community. Um, in addition to that, health um, has been a large component at the Harding University partnership with early detection and s intervention. Health screenings provide, provided for uh, zero to five and for families as well as counseling um, was provided. The Another um, part of our work is family strengthening and case management. Um, we have a system of family, family advocates. We have Padres Adelantes. We have Avance, which um, I was very fortunate to be able to attend that ceremony, which is really spectacular. Um, and we have the really highly successful community evening program at Lacumber Junior High School, which really, um, I believe, is uh, just a signal um, or if, uh, of uh, the strength of um, how those families are feeling that connection with the school and their community. Um, the goal really is sustained progress in school for kids. Um, we don't want kids to do well during just one segment of their experience, but we want it to be. A, we want them to develop the skills necessary, and parents to have the support, to feel that they have the support necessary in order for that student to have a successful experience all the way through our pre-K to uh, 12 system. Um, and so we have the after-school program and the posse program, which I've talked about several times um, in front of you. We just recently got the Casey results for the posse students, 100% passed the high school exit exam. Um, pretty cool. Project College Bound. Um, we also have the PK Parent um, Institute um, at Lacumbra Junior High School as well, and family literacy projects occurring at all those schools. Um, so our work is, um, we've, we, there's a lot of it. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's pretty well focused. We've got a, probably like a zero to five, six program going, and we've got a very effective 7 through 12 program going. And so the obvious question is, well, how about first grade to sixth grade? What are we doing there? And clearly that's the work that we're going to be looking at. In, particularly, in particular, we want to look at grades 4 through 6 and ensuring that students are, are set up and in a place to be successful to take uh, honor, our honors advanced course pathway by the time they get to junior high school to be able to be in the advanced placement, dual enrollment courses by the time they're in high school. Um, I can tell you that the posse program, when I talk to kids, and I'm sure you all have done the same thing I've done, so excuse me for telling you what you already know, um, but when you talk to the posse kids um, at San Marcos or at La Cumbra, wherever you happen to meet them, uh, from my perspective, they always tell me the same thing because I always ask them, how do, wh wh why does it work? What's going on? What's happening to you that's different um, than before? And it is all, for me, it's always been the same kind of theme, and that is I'm not alone. I, I, if, I can't, if I have a question, I can ask Monique. If she has a question, she can ask Ben. Um, it's not me trying to figure out who I can ask for help. Um, I mean, it just seems so obvious. It's, uh, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, Joanne Keynes was able to grasp the obvious out of the, the air and make it a reality for kids. Um, and our goal clearly is to take the zero to five program and the posse program and replicate the elements of it that we know are working um, throughout our district. So I also want to bring to light some of the changes that are occurring in Thrive, because I think it's important. Um, our work, from my perspective, is the most important stuff we do, um, the things that I've mentioned. But in the larger structure, there's also some changes that have occurred. Um, probably the most significant change is Anita Perez-Ferguson has stepped away from her ongoing role as the executive director of uh, Santa Barbara County Thrive, um, and that as an executive committee has been selected um, to kind of be the driving force behind the next steps as Thrive moves on um, in Santa Barbara County. Um, and the executive committee is, is made up of uh, key stakeholders. We have a representative on that, and that's me. Um, and the goal really is to move Thrive forward um, with a commitment on the ideas, um, I think, inherent in the collective impact model, and that is no one can do it alone that we're gonna need help from every one of us. Um, the key element to all of that in our success in moving forward is identifying how we're going to be able to, what I like to say, plug and play with our community. 
where is it that community agencies are going to be able to plug in, support kids, and have that support being aligned with the district's goals and objectives in our strategic plan? How does that work? What does it look like? How do we evaluate it? Um, and um, that's a process that, that, we're, that will take some time for us to really, I think, have, an, a, have a deep and meaningful and effective conversation about that results in some systemic change. Um, and the other thing is, one of the nice things about Thrive, I mean, I, there are times when um, someone um, says, well, why do you need to be part of the county Thrive? Why can't you just do your own West Side thing? Or why can't CARP just do its own CARP thing? Um, those, those, those questions get asked. Um, and my answer has been, I think there's an opportunity to take advantage of what we might be able to learn from IV, uh, Guadalupe, and Santa Maria, and CARP in a more structured sharing and that we wouldn't get if all of us were just doing our own things in isolation. Um, and there, as, as you know, as better or as good as well as anyone, the um, limited resources that we have at our disposal for K-12 education need to be leveraged in every possible way. So we've learned, I, I'm, just, I, I, I'm not here tonight to tell you about all the things we've learned, but I'm going to give you an example of what I think um, we learned from CARP, which seems like a no-brainer, but we, were not, we weren't doing it. And that is try to get into some sort of system where we can assign a student ID number to students as soon as they enter our system in any way so that we can track the interventions that, that are provided for students and their parents, so that we know those students by the time they get into our more formal settings, so that we're able to meet their needs as quickly as possible in those settings. Um, and I think that's a, uh, CARP, CARP came up with that, and that's something that we want to take advantage of. Um, so, um, on the west side, we're still going to stay focused on early childhood education. Um, I think we need to leverage what we know about, about Avance. Um, I think uh, the, it kind of um, intuitively and anecdotally, I would say it's a great program, but I am still going to wait to, to kind of measure the data against our non-Avance students, and we're about able to do that really soon. Um, and the Harding year, Early Years program, um, our goal is to uh, recapture the successful components of it and leverage that out district-wide. We think uh, we need to do that. Um, we want to stay focused on uh, creating those college and career pathways for our students. And um, when every time we go and talk to our secondary teachers and administrators, one of the key elements we keep hearing are those really important skill sets and concept understandings that students in grades four through six get that they n must have when they get away from that wonderful, warm, self-contained classroom to um, the um, six teachers over a school day um, setting we have in our secondary schools. So um, we also know that we want to, as I said, leverage what we know from Posse, hopefully expand it uh, to other parts of our districts and scale those. Um, I, I would conclude by telling you that I, I still believe Thrive offers tremendous opportunities for children in our district. Um, I think it's tremendous opportunities for our community as well. I believe if we can learn how to do this collective impact model, um, I think that also, that process, that what we've learned from it can also be replicated in other partnerships that we'll have uh, moving forward in other areas. So. Um, I thought it was a good opportunity to update you on Thrive since there have been some changes um, structurally. Uh, don't know exactly, um, you know, we're still in the midst of the executive committee as to what, what it's all going to look like at that level. Um, and I believe those decisions will probably be hashed out over the next couple of months. And when, they, when we're done with that, I'll make sure that uh, I report back to you so you can know how that worked out as well. So with that, I take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Cash. Board questions, Mr. Heron? I'll just make a comment. Uh, President Limon and myself attended the graduation of the about 60 parents and their zero to five children marching up to get their diplomas in cap and gown. Uh, that's, er, that's learning really early on the importance of cap and gown yeah. and graduation. And it will be interesting to watch those 60 families as they go through our system yes. because they will have a step up to their uh, you know the similar situation. So, uh, the program and the the graduation and the and and the support those kids got and the families got more importantly in many ways uh, was fantastic. 
Ms. Parker. Thank you for the update. Um, yeah, I've been hearing about some of the changes and kind of wondering what's what's going on next. So I really appreciate the clarification. And um, uh, just to be sure that I understand, so you're saying now that, for example, the babies and toddlers that are coming in um, uh, to the Advanced program, which is really more about the adults, but there is the the um, the, the infant toddler piece as well. Um, they're getting assigned student ID numbers that will follow them whenever they come back, as if it's preschool or if it's kindergarten. Starting this fall. Great, okay. Bless you. Any other questions or comments? I will say that I've had the opportunity, um, at least for the last three years, to present at a lot of the um, Avance parent classes, and their questions are becoming more and more sophisticated every single year. Great. So I really appreciate that. And you know, sometimes they're tough, and I'm like, whoa, let me think about this question, and let me think about the answer. But I actually really appreciate um, what's happening in the transformation and how we think about schools and their understanding of how they can support their students and the teachers and support the principal in the school as well. So th I, I'm, I'm glad the work is happening. Thank you. So this concludes our uh, conference agenda, but we do have one item we need to go back to that was on consent, and that's item E6. Item E6 was the recommendation for approval of the 2013-2016 Medical Billing Technology MBT contract to Administrator Medical Administrative Activities, MA, and Local Education Agency, Medical Billing Option. Take that for a title. <laughs> I just had one question. Okay. Um, in the um, compensation section number seven, it talks about uh, $100 per registered participant per quarter based upon employees registered to participate in MA. It's my understanding in order to be a participant, you have to go through, through some training. That's correct. And so we put people th and the cost money to put them through the training. The training that MBT provides. Put that. And my question is, I understand in the past that maybe 100% of the people who get trained and qualified don't participate in the survey. So my question would be, how many are we paying for? Because we're paying for every single one who's been trained. Um, how, many, how many are we paying for that don't ever do the survey? Currently, I'm not sure what that number is. Helen, do you have any idea of what the participation is? I have some of Megan's notes here, and she mentions she did some um, factoring on 140 participants uh, as far as a number of th that was just kind of a round figure of how many people would be participating and how many of those are actually doing the time That's surveys I don't think that percentage is very high right now so we're 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 making a push to increase so, that so we're paying for 100, we're paying for 140 of which several of them or many of them don't participate that's correct so why do we have a contract based upon the number that get trained rather than the ones that use it Dr. Cash, do you have any uh, My insight? answer would be we're trying to get as many people as possible to do it. Okay, we've had this program for three years. I, I think this is a three-year renewal. I, I'd be curious to know um, what the historic uh, policy is. We've been paying for... We'll find out. Yeah, we'd be happy to bring that back. I'd like back. to know. And yeah. this three-year contract here is cancelable at any time yeah. as well. If the MOF you know, funding ends, it can be cancelled or, or well, I understand we, side. we do come out very well on the MOF funding. Not as well as we could. I, well, yeah, that's, Absolutely. that's a given. But I just don't like paying the fee for, for paying for the training and then paying a fee because they're registered and then not having them use the surveys. And I understand the surveys, you know, take time. But um, a certain, uh, does a certain percentage of, of those fees go back to the group that's doing the survey? Uh, yeah, oh yes, yeah. There's a committee that helps determine the expenditures. Because in the past, um, a couple years ago, there was a certain percentage of the money collected that went back to the school that provided the surveys. I don't think it goes back to the school, but it goes back to the, the employee group that did it. Like, that did it? Yeah. Okay. And then they, they get to determine how to spend it. How to spend it, okay. So just for, I'd just like to know historically uh, over the last three years, um, how many people we paid for training and paid for a fee of $100 if, that's, if that was the same fee. It says we've been reduced, so maybe that was a higher number then. But just to make sure that we're getting um, bang for our bucks. But I'll move approval of the um, 
three-year renewal of the MBT contract to administer MA and LEA Medi Medi-Cal building option programs. Thank you, Mr. Heron. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Buss. All those, any additional discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes 5-0. And there has been a request to bring some information back to us about that. All right, so we are um, unbelievably at the end of our agenda. Board, anything you'd like to see for future agenda items? All right, hearing then, we will adjourn. Thank you. Well, you only had housing board meeting this week. I don't dare go home. <laughs> Now I'm going to have to put the scouts. Oh, my gosh. Only if we can get a, um, just a report on it, uh, just in general. I mean, it's, I'd just like to know.